Romans, the sixth chapter. And I want to read verse number one, verse number two. And then I want to go down to verse number 14 and read verses 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Last Sunday morning, we talked about the fact that he was a God of consequences. The far cry from what we're hearing now, that God is a God of consequences, now we have, we have negated God and, and, and brought him down to the level of uh, uh, somebody who is just a lover. That's all he is. He's a lover, lover, lover. And, and you know, pe people take it so far now, they... They almost make God sound like he's these natural lovers that, that, that we, we ascribe so much. Now, God is love. The Bible tells us that. Amen. But I want you to understand what the love of God is all about. Because even his love necessitates that there are consequences. People say God wouldn't send you to hell. He wouldn't. But he'll let you go there. And you know why he'll let you go there? Because, I told you before, if you want to live as if there is no God, then he'll send you somewhere where you don't have to worry about him. He loves you that much that if you don't want it, he'll put you somewhere where you don't ever have to worry about him bothering you again. So the fact that he is a God of love necessitates that there is also consequences to your actions if you reject this God of love. What did he say? For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then he turns around and tells us that whosoever believeth not shall be damned. Because he hath not believed on the only begotten son of God. So God is a God of consequence. He, he, he says in the book of I believe it's Numbers. Uh, 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 I believe it's Numbers. He says that your foot will slide in due time. It's just a matter of time. God's going God's going to get you. Just give it some time. The Bible says because judgment or sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the heart of men is fully set in them to do evil. Number says be sure your sins will find you out. That's what number says. Uh, be sure that your sins will find you out. Uh, uh, there is an old proverb that says any man that has sought justice or retribution before 40 years has expired has acted too hastily. God has time on his side. He doesn't have to rush to judgment. God has time working for him. There was a comedian who stood on the stage, I believe it was, and said, if God is real, I'll give him, I believe he said five minutes or, or three minutes or something. Said, if God's real, I'll give him three minutes to strike me down. And he looked at his clock and he counted down and, and, and nothing happened after one minute, two minutes. And when time was up, the audience just cheered and wow, because he thought he had defied God in the face of everybody. And they tell me that at the end of his life, and he died prematurely, he begged with an unseen force for three to five minutes to save his life. He screamed and he hollered and begged, please don't kill me, please don't kill me, for the exact amount of time that he stood on that stage defying God. God has time on his side. God, listen, God don't have to get you right then, but be sure that your sins will find you out. Romans 6 and 1, when you have it, say amen. And the Bible gives us this intelligence. I want you to hear what the word of the Lord declares to us. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. Well, that's just your gospel, Bishop. No, because verse number two says, God forbid. It's not what I'm telling you to do. It's what God has declared in his word. God forbid that you should continue in sin and lean on grace. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse number 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. 
for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Did you hear what he said? Grace doesn't mean you can sin. Grace means sin does not have dominion over you. Now you don't serve sin because you are under grace. Under the law they had the can't help it. That's the reason why they had to sacrifice continually every year of the sacrifice of atonement because the law, although it was good and righteous, it was powerless to give man the ability to live uprightly. But under grace, he has given us a new and living way. And now he says that grace means that you are overcomers. You're not the servant of sin. You are not a slave anymore. You are not under the law, but now you are under grace. We have misunderstood grace. And thought grace meant that just because we come to church and, and, and ask the Lord to save us, that that is the end of our responsibility. But that does not end our responsibility. It simply begins a new walk with the Lord. So when we come to the Lord now, that we are coming by grace. Somebody say grace. Grace does not give us license to sin, but grace by its very nature gives us power over the sin that used to have us bound so now it's true that if any man be in Christ they didn't have that testimony under the law because Christ had not come but now that Christ has come died and was resurrected again shed his blood for the remission of our sins now if any man be in Christ not under the law but be in Christ he is a new creature and a new creature is not bound by its old way of living. Y'all done got quiet. That's all right. I've got my work clothes on tonight. Amen. He says, what then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but grace. Again, he says, God forbid. Look at what he says. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness so that means you're not righteous if you are not walking in obedience to God's word mm. oh I tell you it's not what we're hearing now you live like you want to live do what you want to do Say what you want to say and play how you want to play. I told them, that's the Adams family. That ain't the children of God. That ain't God's family. Because God's got a way and that way is holy. Y'all ain't saying on here. How do you know? Isaiah 30. He says, and a highway shall be there. And a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. Look at somebody and just say Holiness. Now, he said that is God's way. I hear what he says. He says, but God be thank, thank you, Lord, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. You heard the gospel. You obeyed that form of doctrine that was delivered unto you. And then he says, hey, being then made free from sin, uh, ye became the servants of righteousness. Being then made free from sin, ye became, past tense, the servants of righteousness. So if everybody sin, you sin and I sin, then at what point do we become the servants of righteousness? Because I'm not a servant of righteousness until after I've been made free from sin. I'm not in no process. Y'all ain't saying that. Look at the church getting quiet. Now listen, this is a sanctified church. And if it ain't, I'm going to preach until you get sanctified. 
I'm not in no process of being made free from sin because I'm not a servant of righteousness until the process has been completed. Being then made free from sin, ye became past tense now the servant of righteousness. Why? Because no man can serve two masters. And to whom ye yield your members, servants to obey, that's whose servant you are. So you can't be serving sin and a servant of righteousness at the same time. Something has got to act upon you that changes your very life. Mm -hmm. Look at somebody, help me announce this text. Tell them, neighbor, grace does not erase the consequences. Grace does not erase the consequences. Grace rather gives us the opportunity to go in the other direction and live according to the standards of God. We are living in a day and time, my brothers and sisters, when men and women all over the world are doing what I called a few years ago, taking advantage of grace. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, don't take advantage of grace. Amen. Amen. Don't take advantage of grace because grace might run out on you. Uh -huh. And what has happened now is that we have taken grace as an opportunity to do what we wanted to do. But family of God, God has a standard by which he governs his people. And God said, if you will not live by my standard, then you are none of mine. You, you are not a child of God. You're not a son or a daughter of God. If you do not live according to the standard of God. Uh, Y'all ain't saying, and I'm going to preach here tonight. Amen. So what has happened over the last few years is that we have gotten away from the mandate of God. And we have uh, gotten into what this... Uh, Christian uh, day that we're in now would call the option of living holy now everybody has options I know what God says but that's not what I want to do right now I'll take what's behind door number two because I have options now it's not like that brothers and sisters when it comes down to God you're either going to do it God's way or you're not his child at all and look at the church getting quiet could I preach here somebody amen either it's going to be God's way or no way at all I told you God don't come in to take orders and God don't come into your life to share you with nobody and with nothing that's the reason why he says let the ungodly man forsake his ways and after you have forsaken your ways then he turns around and said if you're gonna come after me not only do you have to forsake your ways but he says you also have to deny yourself look at y'all I'm gonna preach you tonight amen so God says there is a mandate that I have placed over the body of Christ if you will call yourself by the name of God he said let everyone that's gonna do that depart from iniquity look at somebody pull on them and tell them that means come all the way out hey man that don't mean just be saved from your neck up that means come all the way out of sin see what we have now we have people that want to pick and choose their areas of deliverance I want to be delivered from hatred but I don't want to be delivered from sex y'all ain't saying nothing I'm gonna preach tonight amen I want to be delivered from lying but I still want to cuss a little bit I, I want to be delivered from homosexuality but I don't want to be delivered from fornication listen the Bible said if God's gonna make you free at all he's gonna make you free indeed look at somebody and tell them neighbor come all the way out all the way out of sin and into this marvelous light God is not calling for people to be saved from the waist up and from the waist down they on fire y'all ain't saying nothing here God is calling for a complete and a total turnaround and a change from the way you used to be and he wants to make you what he would have you to be touch somebody close to you and tell them neighbor I believe every word now I believe every word I believe that God still has the power to transform a life 
and when God calls you God calls you to a total and a complete deliverance did you hear what I said I said it has to be total and this deliverance has to be complete oh, now brothers and sisters God is not half delivering nobody oh, look at y'all ain't saying nothing here I got saved but, but I still got the demons in me bishop I got to go to counseling and I have to have sessions where they cast so many out today and then they told me to come back next Tuesday and they'll get the rest of them out they sure they can get them out next Tuesday oh the devil is a liar if God's gonna save you you're gonna be saved look at the church getting quiet here we have accepted the fact that you can be saved and live like a dog but that's not the word of God if God makes you free then you are free indeed did you hear what I said see listen let me tell you something when you come to God and lift your hands and say Lord save me God knows everything you bound by so what God does God ties all of your vices together and kicks them out of your life y'all ain't saying nothing here we act like when God saved us he saved our eyes but didn't save our hands the devil is a liar If I'm saved, I'm saved. So now, so now you got people who are professing salvation but who haven't been delivered. And they say it's okay that I'm not delivered because I'm still in the process. Oh. Now, I know we're all in a process. But now when God delivers me, he don't have to take his time and deliver me. God don't deliver you on installments. God, look at the church. Ain't gonna say amen. That's all right. Hey man, God don't have to deliver you in installments. No. If you come to this altar, I don't care if you came here this morning. If you lifted your hands and asked God to forgive you, if God saved you and delivered you, oh, y'all ain't saying nothing here. That means you got power over everything that you were bound by. When God gave you the Holy Ghost, that means there is no demon in hell, there is no vice, there is no habit. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing here. There is nothing that the devil can present to you for which you don't already have power over it. So you got to get it in your mind now that when I got the Holy Ghost, I received the power of God. And that's not just the power to shout and the power to speak in tongues. That's how you know who really got it. Because if you can speak in tongues and you ain't been changed, then you ain't got no Holy Ghost. Uh, I don't know why they just I don't know why it seems like I gotta preach mean and nasty all the time hey man but listen here if you are not delivered you are none of his and sometimes we're wondering why God is not answering prayer it's because we have not allowed God to come in and to work a work in our life that's what God want to do God don't want to save you for the devil he wants to save you from the devil y'all ain't saying nothing here that's why he says in Jude others are saved with fear you gotta pull them out of the fire you ain't gonna be saving on your way to hell we got this thing backwards and ain't nobody saying nothing so now what we have we have a generation growing now that believe that you can sin and still be a child of God and I want you to show that to me in the word Oh, I know what they twist up now. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he didn't say all sin. Y'all ain't saying nothing here. You look in the book of Romans. Look, look in the book of Romans. Whenever Paul talks about deliverance, he talks about it as it is a finished work. Being then made free from sin, he became the servant of righteousness. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul's not talking about present sin in the life of a believer. He's talking about the sin that you were bound by because every one of us were bound by sin. But touch somebody and tell them I've been changed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh yeah, yeah. All have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God but when I came to the Lord and I lifted my hands and said God I'm sorry God changed me anybody really been changed look at y'all ain't saying I said is there anybody here that's really 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 been are you glad to be changed glad that that stuff you used to do you don't do it anymore and so now hear what Paul says now Paul says that it is not our right to take advantage of this grace no Paul needed to oppose the prevalent idea which so many are even bound by in this hour that said that since God saved people by grace that it didn't matter how they lived. Oh no, child. Oh God, see I know, I know I'm about to get it now. Once you've been saved, you can't never lose your salvation. Boy, if that was true, can you imagine some of the stuff some of us would be doing right now? If I could be saved and do anything, I mean anything, oh, y'all don't believe that yourself. You don't believe that yourself. You mean I can be saved and do anything and didn't have to worry? about a consequence because since God saved me by grace he don't care how I live because I got it by grace I didn't deserve it no way anything now some places need to stop preaching that kind of gospel because folk will be out on the parking lot while we in service taking rims off our cars and everything then come right back in here and sit next to us and shout and act like they're going to heaven. Look at y'all ain't saying nothing here. You don't really believe people can do anything and be saved, do you? It don't matter how you live. So if some man touched your little boy, you could just over, I, I know, you better be glad I'm saved and you saved too. Oh, the devil is a lie. Oh, no, no, no. Look at y'all ain't saying nothing here. You mean I can do anything and be saved? That's the idea that's passing through this world today. That when God saved you, God didn't care how you lived after that point. So once you get saved, you can do whatever you want to do. Because once you in, you ain't never out. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, look at y'all getting quiet. I'm going to preach and I don't care if you get mad. Hey man, Jesus said, it's not an automatic thing. He said, but you got to take up your cross and follow me every day. You don't take a vacation from being a child of God. You don't take a weekend off if you a child of God you one Sunday Monday Tuesday Wednesday oh y'all ain't saying nothing here Thursday Friday Saturday and twice on Sunday look at somebody and tell them neighbor if you're saved you're saved I don't take time off from being a child, child, you almost made me lay my salvation down for a minute. You better keep it up because you don't know if you lay it down if you'll be able to pick it back up again. Look at y'all ain't saying nothing here. Child, I'm going to step out of my Christianity and cuss you out. Oh, no, you can't do that as a child of God. Not if you've been changed and your old man is really dead. Now, 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 if you can step into that old man and cuss at a moment's notice, that old man ain't dead. Look at y'all ain't saying nothing here. I ain't talking about stuff the devil put in your mind, but now, if you cussing folk out in your mind and just saying, hmm, you better be glad that didn't come out of my mouth. Oh, no, no. That old man ain't dead yet. You know how you know when that old man is dead? When they can hit him and he don't respond. Y'all ain't saying nothing here. How do you know when somebody dead? When you touch them and there is no response. When there is no movement, no life in them, no breath in them, then you know that old man is dead. Some of us need to make sure that old man is dead, because every night and then his fingers start moving. Uh, Y'all ain't saying nothing here. Look at the church getting quiet here. Every now and then he starts, oh no, you better make sure that old man is dead or else you are none of his. 
Oh, I know they don't preach this, especially not on TV. But now you can't argue with the word. You, yeah, people can argue with me. You know, I told you a few months ago, somebody sent me somewhere. Somebody wrote an article about me and Apostle Murray. And they say they preach that doctrine. They almost like two Hitlers in the pulpit. I said, well, great God. But you can't argue with the word. Call me what you want to call me. I don't care what you call me. I just want to hear God call me a good and faithful servant. So I'm going to tell you what God said. Paul had to challenge. Antinomianism is what this is called. When you can do what you want to do and still enjoy salvation by grace. The idea that people could live any way they chose to and still be saved was disgusting to Paul. So Paul had to deal with that. And Paul now has to open up their eyes so that they can see that grace is not a license or an opportunity to sin. Don't that sound like permission to sin? If you can do what you want to do because you're covered by grace. That sounds like permission. And Jesus did not come here to die to give us permission to live. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing here. Worse than he did, than we did before he came. Hear what Paul says now. He saw this view as inconsistent with salvation's purpose. Why did God save you? Can you answer that question? Why did God rescue you from sin? Why did he change your life? Because Paul said the reason why God did this was to produce a holy life in you. That's why God saved you. Not so you can sin without consequence, but so that you would in turn live a holy life. God is looking for a life of holiness out of you, not excuses. You are saved to live a holy life. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, God saved you so you could live holy. Not so you could do what you wanted to do. God is producing holiness in the lives of his people. God is looking for somebody now that did not mind being an example before the eyes of the world. How can you be an example to the world when you look like them? When you talk like them? When you go where they go and do what they do, that ain't no example to nobody. Look at y'all ain't saying nothing here. That's why I tell you, in this hour, child of God, it means something to live with a standard. Because in this day and time that we live in now, where men look like women and women look like men, when you got a standard, you stick out. Y'all ain't saying nothing here. They trying to merge everybody, the church and the world, men and women. Oh God, y'all ain't saying nothing here. When you live according to a standard in this hour you stand out what gets me now I understand when a woman dresses holy when a woman dress holy people will come up to her in the store and say ma'am listen what church you go to because you just look like a sanctified. I done went up to people. Ma'am, listen, what church you go to? Because you just look sanctified. It, it's something on you that makes you look sanctified. And nine times out of ten, well, ten times out of ten, they'll tell me what church they go to. I tell them, I know you went to somebody's church. But what gets me is when they can walk up to a man and say, you a man of God. What does a man look like for the world to recognize that he's a man of God? What kind of standard is the brothers living that make the world take notice and say, hey, here you go to somebody's church. Are you a minister? Are you a preacher? You just, you look like a preacher. How, what, what is it on?
on us brothers that make you ain't got on no suit but they see holiness on you you know why because you live in according to a higher standard sometimes you don't even see what makes you different oh god but it's the standard that you are living according to that will make the world stand up and take notice to you and you know that means something to me when somebody comes up and say aren't you a preacher are you a are you a child of god are you saved do you go to church yes i go to church that means something to me you know what i'd rather them do that than to come up thinking they can cuss just because i look like they do Oh, I've had people cuss and, and look around and see me there. Oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. Y'all ain't saying nothing here. But when we live in that type of life and living according to the world so that the world feels comfortable around us, something ain't right. He said, I have called you to live a holy life. Salvation should produce holiness in your life. If you saved, salvation should have brought you to the place to where now your life is characterized by holiness and not by compromise which means now I don't care how quiet y'all get let me come back over here which means now you've got to live on a higher level ain't no more excuses now and I hear you know all the time I told you last Sunday you see bumper stickers going down the road and the devil just laughs I know he does and I know the world feels so comfortable when they see it Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. Mm. Okay. Not perfect. I'm just forgiven. Christians aren't sinless, they just sin less. What? Where, where do we come up with that? Because the Bible said he that commits sin is of the devil. Because the devil sinned from the beginning. So how can a Christian sin less and be of God? Look at y'all ain't sin. And I asked you last Sunday, Jesus looked at that woman that was caught and he says, woman, go and sin no more. Can you imagine if he let her go and say, look, I know they caught you with somebody else's husband, but when you go back, just go and sin less. What? So would you tell a rapist? You can't be sinless, just sin less. Would you tell a child molester? You can't be sinless, just don't touch as many little kids. Is that what you would... Is that what you would tell somebody who was a murderer? Just don't kill as many people. Jesus said, go and sin no more. If not, then explain to me why he came here in the first place. If he did not come to deliver you from sin, why would he come in the beginning? This is a lie from the devil and some of us have bit it hook, line, and sinker. Hear this now. The term conversion refers to the human response to the gospel. While regeneration is God's creation of a new nature in the one who believes. If you have been converted at all, it requires, hear this now, the total commitment of the total personality, the intellect, the emotion, and the will. It, oh, y'all ain't saying nothing here. It involves every area of your personality, your intellect, mm -hmm, your emotion, and your will. And can I say this? You cannot serve God and give your mind to the devil. Your mind has got to speak. Oh, Lord, y'all ain't standing here. Stayed on the Lord. You know, you got a bunch of Christians now who trying to have emotional affairs with the world. 
Hard look at him getting quiet. I had to walk back here so I didn't see nobody's reaction. Hey man, I don't want to look at nobody funny after church. Hey man, it's like a man being married. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And every time he turns around, he's got another woman on his mind. Oh, we ain't done nothing. Oh, no, we ain't never went out. But you having an emotional affair. Oh, when you're with your wife, you're thinking about somebody else and, and, and how much better it would be if this was the woman sitting across the table from you. And that's how some Christians are now. We sitting right up in church having emotional affairs with the world. The devil got your minds. Oh, look at them getting quiet. God, help me preach this here. Your mind is so stayed on the things of the world until now you trying to live holy, but your mind keep telling you you had it better out there in the world. So now you find yourself dibbling and dabbling mm -hmm. trying to get as close to the line as you can get because the closer you get the more satisfaction you feel your flesh don't want to die but Jesus said if you come after me deny yourself tell your flesh no I choose to serve the law mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right somebody get me Titus 2 and 11 Let's take a journey through here. I know school start in the morning. Uh -huh. I'm going to hit this out. And I'm on my way. Titus 2 and 11. You got it? Let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what the Bible says. He says, for the grace of God. Now that word grace is again. That bringeth salvation. Did you hear what grace brings? First of all, what does grace bring? It brings salvation. What does the word save mean? It means to be rescued or to be delivered. You are not delivered unless you are brought out of a thing. All right? And when you're delivered, it's not word that delivers you. It's action. That is the means by which you are saved. Well, Bishop, the gospel changed my life. Yeah, but if you didn't respond to it, I know you're not saved by works, but your response is the action by which you were saved. Because you got to believe it. It's like you drowning in the sea. And all I say is, be rescued. And you out there choking and trying to tread water. And you just, all right, thank you. That's all I need. No, you need to be brought out of that. And sometimes we sitting up going to church thinking word only is going to deliver us. No, you need to be brought out of that. Huh? Y'all ain't saying nothing here. Sitting up under word won't deliver you. You are delivered by your response to the gospel. He says grace, first of all, brings salvation or deliverance. It brings salvation, but then what does he say? It has appeared to all men, but then after it brings me salvation, what does it teach me? Oh, it brought me, but now it's going to teach me. What does it teach me? It teaches me that denying ungodliness, anything that's not like God, grace, teaches me to stay away from it not to indulge in it or make excuses for it grace brings me to salvation but after it brings me to salvation then it teaches me that I've got to deny ungodliness and worldly lust you know what that worldly lust means that means inordinate desires that are not godly that means to desire something that is not of God. Grace, first of all, tells me that if it's not of God, I should not want it. I can't help myself. Every time the devil show up, I fell down. No, no, because grace says to me that if it's not of God, that shouldn't be my desire. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust the things of the world that that word world is again and I don't care what nobody says world is opposite or opposed to anything godly you cannot be godly and worldly at the same time mm. I don't know how else to say it to you you cannot be godly 
and worldly at the same time. You're going to be one or the other because no man can serve two masters. And the Bible says Satan is the God of this world. So anything worldly or according to the system of the world is not godly. So he says, I've got to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And then how must I live? Soberly. Soberly, which means what? It means clear-headed. I should be able to see the world for what it really is. And that means I've got to step back away from it so I can see it clearly. I should live clear-mindedly, soberly. Oh. Huh. Huh. <laughs> I must be coming his way. Soberly and what? Righteously, which means to be holy in your manner of living. And then what? Godly, which means according to the standards of a holy God. That's what grace teaches me. Grace does not teach me that I can sin and get away with it. Are y'all reading the same Bible I'm reading? Is that what grace is teaching you? It teaches me, first of all, that I've got to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's what grace says. Grace does not give me permission to indulge myself. But grace says to me, refrain from it. And how is it that grace can make those type of demands on me? It's because of the way grace came. You know why you enjoy grace? Because God sent his son to die for you. And to satisfy the requirements of God's holiness and his justice. That's the only reason why you can enjoy grace. If Jesus came down here and died, then he died so that you would have an opportunity to come into fellowship with the Lord. That's interesting. That the only reason why I enjoy grace it's because Jesus died. And in doing so, he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came not to show you that you didn't have to live according to the righteousness of the law because the law was righteous. He said, I'm not throwing the rules and regulations and standards out of the window. He came down here to live to show us that it could be done. Then the Bible says he left us an example. Thank you, kind spirit. Left us an example that we should follow in his steps. What were those steps? He said, who did no sin. Jesus didn't sin less, so that's not the step he want me to follow. The Bible said he did no sin. Neither was there a guile found in his mouth. So if you are a sinning Christian, you need to reevaluate yourself because there's no such thing. Titus said, deny ungodliness, worldly lust, live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. He goes further than just live righteously, godly, and soberly, but he tells you to do it right down here. And none of us going to be perfect till we get to heaven. Well, he said, you better live it down here. Did you hear what the Bible said? You better start living soberly, righteously, and godly right down here. He didn't tell you to wait till you got there. Live right now. And I know we don't hear that. We don't hear that. And I'll get to it in a minute. I'm almost through. We don't hear a lot of this because nobody now wants to embrace the reality of power. We like being weak. Oh, y'all ain't saying that. This generation loves being weak and they use it as a crutch. Y'all ain't saying nothing here. The, oh, I can't help it. Child, I just fell down. We love being weak when God came to make us strong. We brag about it now. We even sing about it now. 
we serenade the devil and tell him even though we claim to have all this power all he got to do is show up and we mess up y'all trying to make me sing it I ain't, I ain't go I ain't trying to go there we bragging about the fact that the devil can make us do whatever he want us to do whose servant are you I'm a servant of the Lord. How do I know I'm a servant of the Lord? Because he told me how I would know. To whom I yield my members. That's whose servant I am. And if every time the devil show up, you yielding yourself to the, to, the, to the enemy, then that's who you are serving. Because at the same time that the devil is saying do wrong, the Holy Ghost is saying do right. Now which way are you choosing to go? We act like the devil, the only one talking, do this, do this. I didn't have no other choice. No, at the same time, the devil was right. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing here. God was right on the other side saying, live holy, walk up rightly. And we said no to God and satisfied our flesh. And it made us the servant of sin. And we bragging about it. We falling down. And we getting back up. Everybody falling down and we getting back up. Look at somebody and tell them when you get up, stay up. Why the church getting quiet here? And the church don't have no better sense than to believe anything people say. We love being weak and ignorant. But the Bible tells me now unto him that is able to keep me from falling. Don't tell me I have to fall into sin. But the Bible says, though a just man fall, seven times he'll get back up. He didn't mean fall into sin. That ain't what the Bible meant. You may fall into mischief, but he didn't mean fall into sin. Because if you sin and you ain't just. And by the time you fall seven times, that's a habit. So don't tell me he's talking about into sin. He don't mean though you fall into sin seven times, you get back up because he told you not to sin in the first place. He meant fall into mischief or into calamity. The devil afflicts you and the doctors tell you you got cancer. That may knock you down, but get back up because you're just. And the just shall live by what? Get up and believe God. Circumstances may knock you down, but you just live by faith. Get up and believe God. He don't mean though you fall into sin seven times. We just believe anything. We just, we just believe everything. Come on now, study your scripture. He said he is able to keep you from what? So don't tell me all of us going to fall down when we serve in the God that's able to keep us from falling. You know what the Bible said? He's holding this world together by the word of his power, but he can't keep you from falling. He's holding the universe on his shoulders, but your little old wretched soul he can't keep from falling. Come on now. Is this where the church is now? Is this our frame of mind now? 1 John 2, 1. First John chapter number 2. Verse Number one, you have it? What does the Bible say? My little children, these things I write unto you, not that you sin less, but that ye sin not. Did you hear that? He said, I'm writing this unto you, telling you not to sin. And for a long time, I would hear people say, and the Bible says, but if any man sin, it don't say no but.
he says, and, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm telling you, don't sin. I'm telling you, don't sin. I'm talking to you, don't sin. Listen to his rhetoric now. Listen to what he's saying. My little children, a specific group of people. These things I'm writing unto you. All of you sitting here in front of me. That you do what? sin not now if he's still talking to these same group of people then why didn't he say and if you sin he didn't say if you sin if any man sin if anybody that you know commit a sin he didn't say if you sin because he just told you not to sin and then he talks to these same people in the same conversation and says and if any man meaning somebody other than you because I'm talking to you you don't sin but if you know somebody who do sin, then there's somebody who's sitting up in heaven who is an advocate for every one of us. Not just you, not just me, but everybody. So don't tell me that the Bible gives us license to sin. He says sin not. He didn't say sin less. He said sin not you know why because whom the son sets free is free indeed you know what indeed mean that means completely that means totally that means to the 100 percent of a thing if he sets you free then you're totally free isn't that what the bible says so what do we understand look at somebody and tell them you don't have to sin you don't have to see isn't that what he said the Bible makes that amply clear you don't have to if you got saved today or if you getting ready to get saved tonight understand this you don't have to sin he gives you power over all the power of the enemy is that not what Jesus said he said behold I give what you power over what all the power of the enemy so now what power is it you don't have over the enemy what is it that he have that you don't have power over that keeps causing you to fall because if you got power at all he says it's over all the power of the enemy and if there's something that the devil keeps throwing in your path that you keep falling behind you don't have no power because if you had any power you had power over all the power of the enemy that's what Jesus said. I didn't say that. We think it's just power over lying and power over poverty. It's power to live holy. So you don't have to sin. What does he say? The wages of sin. Even in the period of grace. The wages of sin is death. Sin is going to bring you a payment. And you know what it's going to be? Death! Every sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible says he that commits sin is still of the devil. Sin therefore has no place in the life of a child of God. And I know we keep hearing that we got to sin because we are human. But listen, Paul said, it's no more I, but Christ that lives in me. If Christ is living his life through me, and he knew no sin, neither was there a guy found in his mouth. If he's living his life through me, that means all I got to do is yield to him and let him have his way. And that same life of victory that he lived, he'll live it through me. So you mean to tell me I still got to fall down and sin when Jesus is living his life through me? No more I, but it's the Christ that lives in me. So that means what I'm doing, if I yield myself to the spirit, the victory that I enjoy is because I'm yielding to him and he's gaining the victory, but he's doing it through me. 
So if I'm saved and I'm yielding to him and I'm still sinning, what are you saying about Jesus? Because the Bible said he did no sin and he, he didn't sin in his own body and he's not going to sin through you. So what we've got to do is get back and depend on the spirit of God. That's what we have. And let me say this. Acts 1 and 8. One of the most powerful scriptures to the New Testament church declares, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The reason why people are not really living victoriously is because they're not living it by the means of the Holy Ghost. Listen to what people say now. Just come down, ask God to save you and forgive you. Find yourself a Bible-believing church. You're on your way to heaven. The devil is a liar. You need some power in order to live holy. And the Holy Ghost is the power. Jesus told the disciples, I kept you while I was here. I kept you, which means I was your keeper. I was your savior. You, they were saved. The Bible tells you that. Jesus said, Lord, I kept them. Everyone you gave me, I kept them from the evil one. I kept them. They were saved, but they didn't have power. And Jesus says to them, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. How do you know they were saved, Bishop, further than that? Because the Holy Ghost cannot come and dwell in an unclean vessel. So if they were not saved, they would not have been able to qualify for baptism in the Holy Ghost. But they did not have power. And Jesus told them, don't you go nowhere and try to do nothing until you get power. Some of us come down to this altar and that's all we want. Just be my best friend and I'll serve you. And we go back to our seat. Jesus said, don't you go nowhere and do nothing until you have real power. The reason why people are not being able to live victoriously is because they're not preaching that you need the Holy Ghost. And they're not living through the power of the Holy Ghost themselves. Because anybody that really got the Holy Ghost will tell you that the Holy Ghost don't just sit there and let you do any and everything. Because the Bible said he'll lead you and guide you into all truth. Look at the church getting quiet here. Oh no, the Holy Ghost don't let you go anywhere and say anything and look at anything and read. Uh, look at y'all ain't saying nothing here. If you really got the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost know how to put the brakes on you. Some of you would have done a whole lot of stuff, but there was a voice in the back of your head saying, this is not what I have ordained for you. And if you yield yourself to that voice and live according to the spirit, then you won't fulfill the lust of your flesh. They can't live according to the spirit if they don't have the spirit and they can't have it if they don't preach it. So it's time now for the church to get back to preaching the Holy Ghost. And tell him that he's able to keep you from sin. He's able to keep you from wrongdoing. Because sin still has consequences. And I know we're under grace and I thank God for grace. But grace does not erase the consequences. The wages of sin is still death. He that commits sin is still of the devil. Grace does not erase the consequences. Salvation frees us from it how do i know i'm saved when i live according to the new and living way brothers and sisters god is looking for a life out of you he don't just want your confession god is looking for a life so many people are confessing the lord god said i need a life i'm looking for somebody somebody who would dare to live this life somebody who would stand up and say, I know what the devil wants me to do. I know what feels good. I know what my flesh is pulling me toward. But I would rather hold on to God. Than to grab a hold to a lot of stuff that don't matter in the first place. You know, the sad thing is there are a whole lot of people in that day. And I want you to hear what Jesus said. He said, it's going to be a sad day. Because people are going to be coming up saying, Lord, I know my name on the list. Because I prophesy. Do you know how black that scripture is and how dark that day is going to be? When people run up to the Lord thinking they really on their way into the kingdom and, ah man, I'm going to be eating grapes and pomegranates and I'm going to be swimming in that crystal clear river. I'm going to have two wings that cover my face. And what did the Bible tell you you was going to have wings? I 
I want two wings, two wings. What did the Bible say you were going to have wings? <laughs> to veil my feet. Okay. They're going to run right up to the gate and say, Lord, check the list again. Because I know I'm on that. And you know what? Jesus is going to have to look at people and say, Depart from me. It'll be one thing if he said, I forgot you. But for Jesus to say, I never knew you. He don't mean you somebody that he ain't never seen before. But he's saying, I never knew the truth of your confession. You said that you cast out devils. You said you laid hands on the sick. You said you prophesied. What a dark day that's going to be. When people are running up to the gate, thinking they're going in. And he put his hands up and say, stop. Your name is not here. Bind him hand and foot. Get him out of my presence. You know what kind of day that's going to be. That's going to ruin somebody's eternity. I was saved. I was just sinning less. I never knew you. What kind of day is that going to be? I want you to understand God's position. I want you to stand. Stand, stand when I say this. I want you to just, just hear what I'm saying. I want you to realize what kind of day that's going to be. Understand what kind of day that's going to be. When the world that God loves so much that he gave his only begotten son. This world that he loves so much that he thought to redeem them with the blood of his only son. That world that he cared so much for. That he according to the Bible. Gave us his only begotten son. He didn't even withhold his own son. In an effort to save you and me. That's how much he loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him. Should not perish but have everlasting life. But that's going to be the day when God has got to look at the world that he loves so much. And then say to them. Depart from me. Can you imagine how that's going to pull on heaven? When God, who loved us so much, made, us, made such a way that all we had to do was repent and live holy. And then he has to look at the world that he wanted to save. That he gave everything he had for. And then have to say to that world, depart from me. What is that going to do to the heart of God? To have to look at people, men and women, boys and girls, who he loved so much. Loved them more than they could ever love themselves. But he has to look at them and tell them, depart from me. That's going to be a terrible day. That's going to be a terrible day. And a lot of them will say to him, Lord, I know, I just didn't think it was possible to live holy. But it's in the word. I didn't read you nothing that you can't read for yourself. It's there. And that's how we'll have to make it in. By every word of God. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.